Greatly appreciate it. Okay, without further ado, let's kick it off with panel number one, music, faith, and social justice. Okay, let's get going, because I've, I've only got 15 minutes, and, um, and time is precious. And this um, presentation is entitled, My Faith is a Baseline. I've changed the subtitle to Faith, Culture, and Social Justice. As an activist scholar, I've, co I've come to realise that doing social justice in a post-literate age necessitates the use of audiovisual media, and for nearly two decades, three categories of thought and action have informed my work. These are social justice, theology, and audiovisual culture. The social justice focus is racial justice at home and abroad, the theological perspective, a contextual black liberation theology, and the audiovisual tools, documentary, and black urban music. I'm going to okay. pause. In the 15 minutes I have, and making use of illust illustra illustrative material from my visual project of television documentary and the audio project of Jamaican Bible Remix, I will disclose the transcoding of black liberation theology into social justice practice in both of these media. To start, to start, let me clarify the meaning of the central motif at work here, black liberation theology. Black liberation theology is a complex and diverse discipline of thought and action, making its point of the points of departure from Occidental or Western theology, a belief in divine solidarity with the struggles of oppressed people, a new locus of divine activity that is both committed to providing the resources for the resilience and liberation of oppressed, marginalized, or discriminated peoples, and the transformation of the social and political world to facilitate inclusive than exclusionary practices. My own contextual version of black liberation theology is a critical correlation between Pentecostalism and Rastafari. The product of this conversation is a set of new analytical tropes such as dread, dub, and rotted, emancipation and exorcism. These foci are put to work or inscribed in visual and audio texts. I will show how this process works using examples from film and music. Start with documentary. Why documentary film? because of its campaigning potential and ideological bias. Let me explain. A documentary is a non-fiction film, a representational mode of filmmaking that seeks to document or capture reality. It has the lofty ambition of accurately recreating the historical and social world, and from the outset, always closely, or was always closely allied with social realism and social change. But documentary is not reality, because what the viewer sees on screen is in part an edited reconstruction of a real life event. But this does not mean that there is no truth to the encounter. Instead, documentary represents a particular kind of truth telling. Documentary is best understood as the way that a lawyer represents a client's interest. They put the case for a particular view or interpretation of the evidence before us. This means that the, viewer, the viewers are situated as witnesses rather than, as, uh, rather than vicarious would-be participants. <clears throat> as a result, the viewer must not only look at, but also look through or understand the nature of representation at work in documentary. Filmmakers negotiate this tension at the heart of documentary by choosing to locate themselves somewhere on a spectrum of documentary practice. At one end of the spectrum is empiricist realism. Here the desire uh, is to keep documentary representation as pure as possible. In practice this means adapting rules to ensure that nothing is staged and as little interference takes place as possible. And this approach gives rise to the observational documentary or the fly on the wall method that seeks an unpolluted representation of what takes place. In the opposing camp, 
are those who argue that it's impossible to make a documentary in the pure sense because documentary is more than pointing a camera. It also involves layers of editing and production that make capturing a pure filmic world problematic. The second camp or ideological school focuses on the signifying aspects of documentary. My students will like that because we spent the last two weeks looking at signifying practice. The signifying aspects of documentary that while intimately related to the social world, documentary also signifies the handicraft of those involved in editing it. My approach, or inscribing black theology, veers towards the signifying end of documentary. I attempt to encode the narrative with themes and, and tropes that come out of black liberation theology. I want to give you an example of this. Whoops, that's gone to the wrong one, I think. Whoops. Hold on. I think I've actually deleted the film by mistake. Oh. When I'm there. Hold on, let's see if we can get it back up here. Because, there we go, we had a bit of trouble earlier on. Let's just see if it will come back up now. Ah. I don't know. I don't know if that's the... Was that yours or mine? Not, not yours? Not, I'm not sure. I think... That's not mine. That's not yours. Okay, that's okay. What's happened is it seems to have disappeared for some reason. Whoops. Hold on. For some reason that clip... Oh, don't worry. The, um, I'll have to leave that. For some reason that clip is not functioning. Okay, no worries. As my mum would say, see us yet, I'm strong. Um, right, okay, I was going to show you a, quick, a, a sequence from The Great African Scandal, which I made in two, 2007. At the end of the film, what I attempt to do is inscribe themes from black liberation theology in summing up the film. The film is about the exploitation of Ghana, the Ghanaian cocoa industry by Cadbury's. And at the end of the film, what I do quite purpose, you know, on purpose, is connect the trade justice movement for fair trade in Ghana to African liberation struggles of the 1960s. So in the end sequence, I talk about the fact that we need a new war against colonialism in Africa, but this new war concerns consumers rather than soldiers. I also use the phrase, the fact that this new war, the, moti, the, the motto driving us on, should it be one settler, one bullet, which was the motto of the armed wing of the ANC, again throwing that in as a signifier, but instead this new war needs to be militant. So all the way through at the end of that, that sequence, knitting in ideas from African liberation struggle, black liberation theology into the end of the film so that I fold into the documentary ideas of justice, redemption and liberation. So unfortunately that clip doesn't work, but hopefully the other, the other clips will work. Fortuitously, Let's move on from that. Fortuitously, this struggle was won in part a few years later when one of the companies investigated, Cadbury's, uh, relented on a policy of exploitation and moved to fairer trade. So 18 months later, after the film was broadcast, and I should say the film was part of a, um, a campaign led by Christian Aid and other charities to force Cadbury's to change policy. So 18 months later, they actually sent out a couple of representatives to come and see me. I was teaching at Oxford Brooks at the time. And they sent these two um, people from their, uh, their public relations office to check the facts that we had regarding child labour in Ghana. Because the way in which we tried to expose them and shame them was by saying, was by demonstrating that Cadbury's chocolate was made by child labour. And they always claimed it wasn't the case. So we showed that that wasn't the case, we, we demonstrated, and to their credit, they changed policy um, later on. So what this demonstrates is that inscribing black liberation theology in documentary film as a form of praxis has, has an, a, um, an end product. It has an impact on the social and political world. In this case, the Cadbury's changing policy. Um, I should say as well that one of the awards that I actually have is that I, they made me an honorary chief um, in northern Ghana, in Tamale, as a result of this program, because the, one of the end results is that the change in policy will lift a million children out of poverty. 
So they wanted to honour me and they said to me, um, we're going to make you a chief of this area. And I said, well, look, I don't really want to be a chief, but you know, um, <laughs> fair enough. They said, um, they said, I said, what does the chief have to do before I continue? They said, they said the chief has to um, look after this land. And I said, well, look, I can't farm. <laughs> it's going to be a problem. Then they said, the chief has to pay for all the medical bills and school bills of the people in the area. It's your so I said, look, I can't have that responsibility as well. It's too much. Then they said, then the chief has to marry 20 of the most attractive women in the area. And so, and so I said to myself, how can I let these people down? No, I, did, I did say that, I did say that. But, but ultimately, we were able to change policy. And again, showing this relationship between theology, visual culture, and social justice at the end. Let's move on to the second example. The second example uh, a, co a cultural practice I want to talk about is digital recording. Digital re recording is based on tracking or layering tracks in a digital workstation, in, the case, in my case using Cubase program. It is a technical process concerned with the stretching, looping, compressing and mixing of sound to create, organise and produce the track. Each track will contain bits of audio that include drums, guitar, keyboards and vocals and other instruments. These tracks will be mixed in various submixes or grouped together to produce a more precise final mix. All mixing involves tracking, and um, my tracking technique consists of two processes, theological tracking and intersectional style. In theological tracking, there are three distinct tracks at work. These are a scripture, oops, no, these are a scripture, yeah, let's go to that one. They are, these are scripture tracks, which consist of samples from the Jamaican New Testament, music tracks or genres from black urban music, and finally, message tracks, which are political, theological messages, either rap spoken or sung, and inspired by social and political, religious, cultural themes in black liberation theology. These tracks are then mixed or intersected based on an intersectional style. Intersectional style describes a mixing technique which takes its lead from intersectional analysis and critical correlation. Intersectional analysis is a complex tradition with a long history in African diaspora communities, particularly black feminism. It explores the simultaneity of sameness and difference in relation to matrices of power. But simply, it's a mindset that keeps in view the over overlap or configuration of categories of race, class, gender, sexuality and ability in relation to inequality and power. Critical correlation describes a theological, cultural, a theological dialogue with the social world. In some, a conversation between theology and popular culture where both discourses have the potential to provide theological meaning. Combined intersectionality and critical correlation produce a new mixing technique whereby the tracks are layered juxtaposed or equivocated in order to invent new theological ideas which are always placed inside of power relationships. And I want to give you two examples of how, of how this works. Um, let's just uh, move on from there. Um, oops. I want to give you two examples of how this process and of tracking works, this mixing <coughs> process based on intersectionality and critical correlation. I want to provide two examples. First example is um, from, and it's on the lyric sheet, it is a track called The Incarnation, No Blacks, No Irish, No Dogs. And in this track, we juxtapose the idea of the incarnation, the idea being that it is a statement about inclusivity. God living in all flesh means that all flesh is good. We juxtapose that reality, that theological reality, with the social experience of first generation African Caribbean men and women coming to Britain and seeing that infamous sign in the windows, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. We have a bit of artistic license on my part. I framed it as no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. So we juxtapose those two traditions. But then what I decided to do was in order to update that experience, the contrast between the idea of the incarnation, meaning e inclusion, equality, with a contemporary practice of injustice, namely um, the deaths of black people in custody. So in the visual presentation, the music video, which we uploaded on YouTube, we overlay the old story of 1950s discrimination, juxtaposed to the idea of the incarnation, 
and that then is overlaid with this more modern uh, uh, representation. So hopefully um, this will work. And the lyrics are, there's a draft version of the lyrics there um, for you to follow, to follow the, the song. Note that the sample from the Jamaican Bible, the, the scripture track, it's a Jamaican New Testament that we're using. We sample the audio partly because the Bible Society who produced it gave us some of the funding for the project, so we had to include the Jamaican New Testament, but we weave that into the narrative as the strict scripture track. Okay. I want to um, use as an illustration, you see what we're trying to do there, juxtaposing inclusion of the incarnation with the problem of post-war immigration, that then updating it, and but folding all of that into a theological narrative that raises the question, how do we then talk about the incarnation when we have these questions of inequality and injustice, which aren't just in the past, but also in the present. And then later on in the song, when I come back into it, I talk, I critique the inability of contemporary, well, the inability of the theology of the incarnation to work through in practice in the Western tradition so it becomes more than just a statement, it becomes a practice of hospitality. So that's just one example. The other example that I want to show you is, um, share with you is a womanist track. Um, we've actually just started filming a, a film, a, a video to go, go with this, but, but if you just follow this one on the sheet, it's um, what we've done here, it's called the Magnificat. Magnificat, as you know, is Mary's song in Luke 1, where Mary um, is told that she's going to have this um, child, Jesus, and she sings this fantastic song. What, we, what I do here is weave into this song, through the work of a, a rapper that we worked with called Justice, the whole idea of black women's liberation and the way in which um, that's been celebrated in a heroic way. And we have a rapper called Justice who does a rap over that for us. But the genre we choose to do this is Lover's Rock. Lover's rock genre is chosen specifically. Um, the drama that we just looked at, that we used before, I should say, we chose because it represents British soul. Um, it's similar to the work of Junior Giscombe, and we use it for a particular reason. All the tracks signify. In this track, Lover's Rock signifies because Lover's Rock was the own, is the only genre ever created in Britain just for women, and just for black women in particular. The only musical genre. One of my, four, one of my PhD students, Lisa Palmer, has written um, essays on how Lover's Rock was a kind of feminist movement, a cryptic feminist movement for black women who celebrated themselves, their bodies, and life through this musical genre. So again, folding this black feminist genre, the potential of that, into Mary's song, which is a song of liberation for black women, and then having Justice, this rapper from Birmingham, craft a narrative about black liberation for, for, for women. So I'm just going to play this one um, for you as well as an example. I believe we need to hear more women's voices in public life, in particular for the next generation. If we're going to change the dynamics of what we have today, where it is still sort of a man's world, then women today need to step forward to enable their children and their grandchildren, in particular girls, and actually boys too. Boys need to see that their counterparts can be equally respected in terms of the contribution that they bring to the table. Luke chapter one. May a God bless woman. Has the most powerful God do the miracle here for me. Impoli. God good can't do it. from the Jamaican New Testament. We'll use more of it in this track. So we've got Mary's narrative, which is then folded into this more contemporary political black feminist narrative, which is crafted by the rapper Justice, which is then encased within 
the soundscape which is fundamentally lover's rock, which again is another genre which has a particular history um, in terms of the affirmation of black women's lives within Britain. So crafting a whole new sonic fiction that foregrounds black liberation theology, but in this case, black liberation theology in the form of womanist theology. So in summing up, I think we've been over my 15 minutes, um, what I'm suggesting is that we must consider diverse media to communicate ideas and challenge power structures as well as mobilize our communities. Thank you.